you were here last week, Pastor Max started us off uh, kind of talking a little bit about the idea of generosity. Um, and I think most of the time when we hear the word generosity, uh, it, it goes kind of hand in hand with the idea of money. That's kind of the first place that we, that we think. And that is actually kind of where he went with it last week, just talking about the idea of being generous within our finances, generous within uh, just kind of uh, that side of our life. And, and he talked a little bit about I think some of the ideas that go around our world, and one of them right now is this, uh, that, that the church is just after your money. The church is after your money. I, I mean, that's a common thing. You hear it a lot from people. And, uh, and Pastor Matt kind of went into that and said, you know, God doesn't need our money. God doesn't need our money. God wants our hearts. And that was a big premise of last week. You know, if, if God wanted a church to stay open, he could keep it open. You know, I'm sure we've all heard the stories of, man, I needed to pay this bill or this was going to happen and I had nothing. I went out to the mailbox, I opened the letter, and there was a random check for the exact amount that I needed. You know, and I know that's uh, even Jen at one point, uh, Jen Dwyer, Max's wife, uh, that happened with getting a new guitar right before when she was in college, before recording a CD and just the amazing things where, where God provides. Financially, if God wants to provide, he can. So the church isn't necessary. The church is not after our money. God is not after our money. God is after our hearts. It's a heart thing. And Max said this line: if, if God can get a hold of your checkbook, He can get a hold of your heart. And I think that's because for so many people, those things are so loose or so closely connected. And our world kind of makes it where it has to be that way. You know, we, we have to have money to survive. We have to have money to pay the rent, pay mortgage, buy groceries, whatever it is. Money keeps us moving. So it's hard to not at some point kind of focus on that. But then he talked about this idea of he had us all close our fists. And he said, how much can you hang on to with a closed fist? Versus how much can you hang on to if your hands are open? If we live with open hands... Financially, the amount that God can just pour into your hands and pour over and beyond and overflow out of your hands to bless the people around you. I just I loved uh, that analogy and just looking at that as I sat and watched everyone around the room kind of put these closed fists up and open their hands. And, um, and it was amazing, but it, it kind of left us with this question. Okay, we're talking about living generously. That's living generously within our finances, what does it mean to just live generously? How do we have just a generous life? How, how in all of who we are, in our being, can we be generous? What does it look like to live generously, to love generously? How can we be generous with our relationships, with our abilities, with our talents, with our time? In today's world, money may be one of the most sought-after things, and, and no doubt it's an idol for a lot of people, but I would actually argue, and I think you could make a great case, that there is a greater idol than money, and that is our time. Our time. There's a, a movie that came out uh, just under a decade ago, and um, I'm not giving my pastor stamp of approval on this. It's, it's always dangerous when you start talking about movies. But the name of the movie was called In Time. All right, so some of you guys have seen it. It, was kind of, it wasn't like a low budget, but it, was, it wasn't a blockbuster either. And the, <laughs> rightfully so. Uh, but the idea of it was this. It's a couple hundred years in the future. And uh, medical has advanced. And actually when you reach the age of 25, you stop aging. You're done. You're just, you're 25. How many of you guys are like, oh, I'd love that. 25, you stop aging. But when you hit 25... You have a little clock on your arm. They kind of like, you know, superimpose this little digital clock on everybody's forearm that started to count down for one year. And when your time was up, you died. But the idea was there wasn't money anymore. Time was the currency. So when you would go to work and you'd put it in an eight-hour day, they might pay you 16 hours. You'd go and you'd do this and, and you would get paid in time, but you would pay your bills with time. You would pay groceries with time. You could share your time with the people that you love. It was just an interesting concept and, 
And the rich and the famous and the elite would have decades and centuries of time. They had no concern. They could just live their life. And the poor were just making it day to day to day. There's a scene where a woman pays bills and takes off sprinting to try and get to a family member because she's literally got minutes. And she's got to get to a family member, otherwise she's going to die. And it's just this whole interesting idea of time. Time, I could argue, is our new currency. Not in that way necessarily. I mean, I, I haven't paid any bills with, with time and, uh, and I could roll up my sleeve. I, I don't have any sort of a clock on my arm. But time is a currency in today's world. It's the new dollar bill. You know, in a sense, vacation is kind of like this. You know, we, we will forego money for the illusion of more time in our life. You know, if you don't have paid vacation... You reach a point where you're like, okay, in my life right now, I don't have the ability to do what I want. I want to go to Florida, and when I get off work at 5 o'clock, there's not enough time to go to Florida and back before I work tomorrow. You know, I don't even want to go for the weekend, because by the time I get there and this, you know, it's just... So, to give us the illusion that we have more time, we will forego getting paid, we will take vacation. As parents, we don't have enough time maybe to spend with our spouse, so we will take our hard-earned money that we gave time for and turn around and give that money to a teenager to watch our kids so we can pretend like we have more time in our life and go out with our spouse on a date. And, and I'm not saying this in a negative way at all. This, this is just how we, we live life. And, but time is such an interesting thing when we, when we look at this it's just the world that we live in. On average right now, um, there's some decibel, decibels in this, but it's, it's about um, 78 years is the average lifespan. It's like 78, and the decimal is like 0.86 or something. 78 years roughly, women live longer than men. I guess we make a lot more dumb decisions. Uh, that's probably true. Maybe that's the reason why, but women live longer. 78 years. 936 months. I don't like that one. That doesn't sound right. A month is such a short amount of time, and 936 of them isn't enough. 28,489 and a half days. That sounds a little better. I don't know why, but that month one just kind of scares me. You want to hear some sad statistics of how an average person is going to spend their time in their life? If you were to live to be 70, on average, you will spend 20 years and three months asleep. <laughs> 10 years and five months watching TV. Whew. That would lower if they took the office off Netflix for me, but it, <laughs> right now it's probably more than that. Seven years and six months eating and drinking. Five years and nine months in transportation. Eighteen months waiting in line. And it, it, this one's the worst. Sitting at red lights. Six months. Six months of your life sitting at a red light. Doesn't that make you like when you're out driving at 11 because you had to go and, and run somewhere and you're sitting there and there's no cars within like a mile and you're like... I'm not wasting six months of my life, you know. You're just like, <laughs> six months at red lights. Oh, that's crazy. It's crazy to think that for, for some people in our world, they'll spend more time sitting at a red light than sharing God's love with people. Time is something we can never get more of. We trade a non-renewable resource like time for a temporary renewable resource like money. And then very quickly end up trying to trade that back. I think subconsciously we realize what we've done, but there's nothing we can do about it. We've said if you want to see where someone's heart is, look at their checkbook. And, and I agree with that. 
But I, w- I would go a step further and say, if you want to see where someone's heart is, look at where their calendar is. Look at how they spend their time, what they do throughout the day, throughout the week. Jesus was arguably the most generous person who has ever lived. And he embodied what it meant to be generous just in all areas of your life. Beyond financially, because actually the, the funny thing is, is we don't really have any scriptural examples of, of Jesus being financially generous. I'm not saying he was, not a heretic, please don't yell at me. But we, just, we don't see that in scripture, but we do see him being incredibly generous in all areas of his life, specifically in time. I think that where the problem is, is all of this for Christians... When we look at how Jesus lived his life and how he spent his time, it doesn't always look very similar to the way that we spend our time. Now, I know any time we start to kind of do the comparison of Jesus and us, right away there's some like serious problems with that comparison. All right, not many of us are a single 30-year-old guy who have people kind of providing food and a place to live. And I mean, if that were the case... There may be a few more people that are, that are walking around and doing that. But ultimately, I think the biggest problem anytime we start doing this comparison is I feel pretty confident in saying no one in the room is the son of God. Right? Like we can't, you're like, oh, you're going to make me compare myself to Jesus? Well, come on. That's not fair. He's God. Am I supposed to expect that I'm living up to that? And I'm not going to say that that's necessary. That our life is going to look exactly like his. But as Christians, shouldn't we be striving to look as much like him as we can. So then in some way, shouldn't the way that we spend our time, even if it's our free time, I realize we have jobs, we have other things we have to do, but our free time, shouldn't we be spending it in a way like he did? So we're going to look at at a passage of scripture today in in the book of Mark. Mark's one of the gospels. If you have your Bible, you can open it. Otherwise, it's going to be on the screen uh, behind us. Uh, and we're going to look in Mark, and, and this passage is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, but it specifically, I think, shows us and gives us insight into how Jesus was generous with his time in his life, how he was generous, actually even just beyond time in, in everything. Jesus was constantly pulled in different directions by many different people, you know, not too unlike us. You know, so you have to go to job and you have to do this. You have to spend time with family. You have to have somewhat of a social life and all these different things. You feel pulled in all different directions. Everybody wanted to be healed. Everyone wanted to be fed. Everyone had some need. And Jesus always gave of himself more and more. So in Mark chapter 5, we're looking at verse 21 is where we're going to start. Um, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. Like I said, I, I believe it'll be on the screen behind us. Jesus got into the boat again and went back to the other side of the lake, where a large crowd gathered around him on the shore. Then a leader of the local synagogue, whose name was Jairus, arrived. When he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet, pleading fervently with him. My little daughter is dying, he said. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Now this is common for Jesus. I mean, everywhere he went, someone's always running up to him. Please, can you help me? Please, I beg you, can this happen? Everywhere he'd go, someone is running up to him when they, as soon as they saw him. In the story in Luke, it actually says that this is the guy's only daughter or only child. He's coming and just begging, pleading, can you please come and help me? Verse 24 Jesus went with him, and all the people followed, crowding around him. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. She had suffered a great deal from many doctors, and over the years, she had spent everything she had to pay them, but she had gotten no better. In fact, she had gotten worse. She had heard about Jesus, so she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his robe. For she thought to herself, if I can just touch his robe, I will be healed. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. And she could feel in her body that she had been healed of her terrible condition. Jesus realized at once that healing power had gone out from him. So he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my robe? His disciples said to him, Look at this crowd pressing around you. How can you ask who touched me? But he kept on looking around to see who had done it. 
Then the frightened woman, trembling at the realization of what had happened to her, came and fell to her knees in front of him and told him what she had done. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Your suffering is over. While he was still speaking to her, messengers arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. They told him, Your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But Jesus overheard them and said to Jairus, Don't be afraid. Just have faith. Then Jesus stopped the crowd and wouldn't let anyone go with him except Peter, James, and John. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw much commotion and weeping and wailing. He went inside and asked, Why all this commotion and weeping? The child isn't dead, she's only asleep. The crowd laughed at him, but he made them all leave, and he took the girl's father and mother and his three disciples into the room where the girl was lying. Holding her hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And the girl who was 12 years old immediately stood up and walked around. They were overwhelmed and totally amazed. Jesus gave them strict orders not to tell anyone what had happened. And then he told them to give her something to eat. Now there's a lot happening in, in this story. You know, kind of two stories, but really one story. And uh, it, What Jesus says to the little girl, to Lithicum, which actually is, uh, you know, our New Testament is in Greek. This line is in Aramaic. And it's actually pretty well thought that it, from day to day, Jesus and his disciples would have spoken Aramaic to each other. And when this was all translated into Greek, for some reason in this one, in each one of the three stories where this is shared, this is left in Aramaic. And I think just kind of a, a little thing for us before we move on is this. I think they wanted to show this phrase is the same phrase that the parents would have came in and actually used to wake up the girl if she was sleeping. It's just an everyday phrase. Just basic. They wanted to show there wasn't any abracadabra special formula that Jesus did. God works through the mundane details of our life. Just the everyday small moments, he can work through those. It doesn't need to be something big and special. Now, through this story, Jesus is giving of his time. And I think it's, it's easy in this story, and, and I do this all the time, and in any of the Gospels as we look at them, to kind of look at it as like, okay, we have a bunch of highlights from Jesus' life. Right? Like this happened, and a week later this happened, and a couple days later this happened, and sometimes that is the case. But then there are other times where these events are actually running right into each other. And that's the situation in this one. All right, we're going to talk about giving of our time. We need to look at actually how much time Jesus had been giving in this. The day before, he had been on a lake shore and he began teaching. He shares parables with people and he continued to share. And at the end of the day of teaching, he gets into a boat with his disciples to head to the other side. At this point, I would assume he's tired teaching um, if you teach or if you've ever been in that spot where you kind of are doing like public speaking or any of those types of things, it's this weird draining thing. Um, you just kind of pour everything into it and you get to the end of the day and, and it just feels weird. I'm not saying that other jobs are not. <laughs> A lot of jobs are very draining. Um, but he had been teaching all day. Uh, there's no doubt that people were coming to him and, and kind of just saying, hey, can you answer this question? Can you do this? Can you meet this need? What about this? And he's teaching, 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 reaches to the end of the day. He's physically and emotionally drained. And we can't forget that Jesus was a man. He was 100% God, but he was 100% man. It's this weird thing we have a hard time wrapping our brains around. It's not 50-50. It's 100 and 100. He had a physical body. He ate food. He slept. He was tempted like we were. So he's going to be tired just like any other person physically. And they take off in their boat, and other people start piling into their boats and following them. All right, so I'm sure this wasn't Jesus, but this would be me. Are you serious? You see what they're doing? I spent all day with them. I cannot get away from these people. And they're following him, and he's like, okay, man, this is, can you guys like row faster? Like put another sail up? Do we have things we can throw at them to try and get, like slow them down? Just want some time alone. Again, this is me, not Jesus. People just want more and more and more. 
You ever gotten to sleep after a draining day and you know you have to get up the next morning and do it all again? Right? Like it's not Friday, it's Monday. It's Tuesday, you know, whatever it is. It's, man, I gotta, today was awful. But tomorrow's gonna be the exact same. And you go to bed and you lay down and it's not very relaxing. You lay down, you close your eyes, and somehow there's this magical thing that happens that as soon as you close your eyes, your alarm goes off. And it's the next morning. You know, the nights where you don't need to sleep, you wake up, you're like, oh man, I slept great. That was amazing. It felt like I just slept for a week. And then those nights where you're just drained and exhausted, and as soon as you close your eyes, the alarm is beeping. And you're like, oh man. Jesus gets into the boat. He lays down to take a nap. Closes his eyes and is woken up by the disciples screaming in his face. You know, ever woken up by someone screaming at you? It puts you in a great mood, right? Right away, you're like, how can I help you? No, you're like, what was wrong with you? Quiet. Oh, what is going on? The disciples are yelling, what? Is, we're in the middle of a storm. We're going to die. Don't you care? Jesus gets up, rebukes the wind and the wave, calms the storm. They reach the other side. He gets out of the boat. This isn't where our story starts yet. A man comes running up who is possessed by many demons. This guy, I mean, he's been the town's trouble. They've tried to lock him up, breaks the chains every time. Guy's running around. He's butt naked. And Jesus is like, of course, this is what I'm dealing with today. Again, this is me. This is my commentary. This is not Jesus. He would be fine with this. But he deals with the man, deals with the demons patiently. And, and, the, and even the demons, in all honesty, when you look at the story, he has grace on them. They say, please don't send us to the pit. Send us into those pigs. Jesus has grace, sends them into the pigs. The pigs go over the cliff. 2,000 of them. They all die. The herdsmen take off running back to the town. The whole town comes out. The guy that's been naked for years is now clothed. The pigs are gone and dead. They're like, what is going on? Please leave. They aren't even grateful. He is giving everything more and more and more. Please leave. We are scared of what's happening. Gets into the boat, goes back again, gets out of the boat, and this is when Jairus comes running up. Hey, my daughter, she's dying. I need you. Josiah would have said, I will after a nap. Give me, just give me 15 minutes. Just give me 15 minutes. Jesus right away, yes, of course, goes with him. Now, as he's walking, in comes this woman into the story. She works her way through the crowd, reaches out and touches him. And here's the interesting thing. She's healed right there. The miracles already happened. Jesus felt the power went out. He knew that someone was healed. His job was done. Instead, he chose to take the time to turn, find this woman, identify her, and minister to her right there. Goes beyond the physical and ministers to her heart. He says, you know what? This Savior that just healed you also cares about who you are personally. He takes the extra time to do that. He could have kept walking. She was already healed. When I get to that place of exhaustion, man, my patience and my grace is just gone. Right? Like you just kind of start losing it and it's times where you normally be like, oh yeah, that's okay. You're like, what is wrong with you? You know, and you just, your filter starts to go. And really, I, I start to just mail it in. Like, what's the bare minimum I have to do here to get the job done? All right, we're like, no one's going to be calling and complaining. Okay, that's what I'm going to do here. Because you're just exhausted. You're tired. Not Jesus. After healing this woman, he takes the time to show God's love to her. While he's doing that, messengers come up and say, hey, don't bother him anymore. Your daughter died. 
Again, he could have said, okay, that's a bummer. Now I'm going to go take a nap. Instead, he turns to this guy and continues to minister to him. He says, I'm not done yet. Don't be afraid, just have faith. He goes and finds the little girl and he brings her back to life. It would seem in this story that as Jesus became more exhausted, he actually handled things even better and had more grace and more patience and more love and more compassion for people. That doesn't describe me. I wish it did. But that's how Jesus was. And again, we can't go back and just say, well, he was the son of God. We can't really look at that example. He was 100% man. He had a body like you and I did. He needed sleep like you and I did. He was giving and giving and giving. That's what a generous life looks like. Beyond the time that he gave, there's actually more happening in this story than I think we always realize in our 21st century Western minds. Beyond the time, he's choosing to go to a house uh, where there's probably going to be a corpse. And if you've read through parts of the Old Testament, you know this whole idea of being ceremonially unclean. And if be, being around a dead body was one of the major ways that you became unclean, and when you became unclean, it was a huge process to become clean again. When you're unclean, you can't be around other people. You get pushed off to the side, and, and it takes seven days. you got to go through these rituals and this and this and this. It was a big deal. He's exhausted, and they come and say, hey, can you come? My daughter's dying. And he, he forgoes that idea of I might become unclean and just says, of course, I'll go. As he's going, a woman who has internal, chronic internal bleeding, another main way that you became unclean in those days, for her, it was transmissible. If she touched somebody else, it wasn't that they would start bleeding, but they were unclean. And she goes and touches him, and he still turns around and ministers to her in the midst of all of this. He gives and he gives, and he never, ever distinguishes between who he gives to. I think that's one of our biggest faults just as humans. We, 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 we look at people through different lenses. We look at them differently. We, we see what they can do for us. We see what they've done for other people. Whatever it is, we play favorites. These two people, Jairus and this nameless woman, could not be more different. He is well-known, well-respected religious leader. He actually has a name in this story. Names were incredibly important. He has a stable job, a family. And as a man of distinction, he can openly approach Jesus with a request. Versus a nameless woman who has to approach from behind in secret. She is a disease that has been trying to get cured. She spent everything she has on doctors, and all that happened is it got worse. Her hopes of bearing children with this disease would be gone. With the possibility of children gone, the possibility of being married is almost not there. It's impossible. If you're not married, there's no one to provide for you. Her disease would have been treated the same as leprosy. She'd constantly be ceremonially unclean. She wouldn't be able to be around other people. She'd be cast out from her family, cast out from the city, and live out in a group outside of the city walls together with people with leprosy. They'd never see their family again. As one commentary put it, this, this sounds so harsh, but it gives you the idea of how she would have been looked at in those days. She was walking pollution. No value. The best of the best and the worst of the worst by their cultural standards. But they had something in common. They both needed Jesus. They both had heard of Jesus. They both desperately desired healing. And they both had run out of options. And Jesus loved them both equally. He gave to them both equally. He had compassion on them equally. How can we live like this in our everyday life? How can we live this out? We aren't Jesus. We don't live in this 
world that he lived in. Before we can ever start to live out the life in this type of way, where we give of ourselves as holy as Jesus did, we have to have his heart. It's got to be the right motivation. Have you ever tried to give when you have the wrong motivation? You don't enjoy it. It's noticeable. You regret it. You get mad. Could have spent that money on something else. Could have spent that time doing this. Got to have the right heart. Outward actions rarely predate inward change. This story of Jesus loving so equally, it's, it's difficult in our modern world. It's hard to bring the idea of these two people and how drastically different they were and what it meant to love both of them equally. It's hard to bring into our modern world. I'm going to try. And in an attempt, I'm, I'm going to ruffle some feathers in the room. I just know that. I have found when I get upset about something, it's usually a good time to reflect on things. I guess we could say a, a law-abiding citizen is not any more worthy of Jesus' rescue or love than the person that's behind bars for the rest of their life. And if no one is more worthy of his rescue and his grace and his love than any other person, then they shouldn't be any more worthy of our grace and our love than any other person, right? I think most of us can probably nod our heads and agree with that statement. That's an easy one. When we start putting specifics to it, what does that look like? Someone who's respectable in society suffering from something that's not their fault at all versus maybe someone that many in society would see as choosing their own path. They've made their choice. Now they got to live with it. Almost deserving of the negative that is in their life. You know, the person who has overdosed for the fifth time and is just given a, another shot of Narcan is free. Versus the person who's living with diabetes and can't afford their insulin. They both are equally deserving of God's love, God's compassion, his rescue, and of our love and our compassion as anybody else. A person who's been living here in the U.S., paying taxes, serving our country, is not any more worthy of being saved by Jesus, being loved by him, or being loved by us than the person that snuck across the border into our country illegally. I know some of these things are hard for us to, as I was trying to come up with some of these examples, like, man, that's, oh, that's, those are hard. Jesus' love didn't know any bounds. Jesus' love was not handed out differently depending on who you were, what you had done, what your past was, who your parents were. And when we follow in his example and we want to live a generous life, it needs to be the same for us. Our love, our compassion for people should be modeled after his. But we automatically see people through our own biases, through our own lens, and many times we show partiality one way or another to people. But if we want to have God's heart, if we want to have his eyes as we look at our world, we need to understand these things. Because if we don't have the right heart, we can't do anything else. Once you have that heart, what's next? Well, now we need to start to create time in our life where we can actually be used by God to live this out. We have to plan in margin time, extra time. We have to create that extra time to go out of our way to help somebody. Maybe start to leave for work a little earlier, plan our grocery trips a little longer. Stick around after your kid's sporting event and rub shoulders with other parents. Not just to have fun, but because you want to see the needs that are there. Stick around after church on a Sunday, not to just spend time talking with your friends, but to see, hey, who is in desperate need? of some healing today, of some love today. You're never going to see God moving if you don't have margin. 
It's not that God won't move, you just won't see it. And you won't be part of it. Because what will happen is God wants to move, the Spirit starts to prompt you, He wants to do something, and you're thinking, no, I have to get to this thing. Right? That's what we do. We overbook ourselves. We leave early from one thing so that we can get late to the next. How is God ever supposed to lead us, guide us, and use us if we don't give him the time to do that? We need to make our lives flexible in our time. We need to be willing to have our plans interrupted with his plan. Like in theory, we're all like, yes, that sounds good. Until you start saying, oh, that plan? No, can't you do it in the next plan? I don't like that one. Can I? God, can't you pull me out of this meeting? Come on, this is a great time. You need me? I'm ready to go. Put me in, coach. As I was thinking about this, and and again, looking back to Jesus' example, when did he give more and more and more? When did he live generously? So I was looking through the Gospels, and and I read through every spot where where Jesus was doing a miracle. All right, so I'm going to use this as an example of him giving more and more. There's plenty beyond that where he would give time in a conversation. He would spend time with people. He would go to someone's house to eat. But I looked at the miracles. And I have this list of what was happening in his life when it was interrupted and he went and did something for God. All right, now as I read this list, I want you to put yourself in this and think, okay, if I were in that situation, how willing am I to get up, walk out, sacrifice, leave whatever I'm doing for God? You know, and and it's easy to say for God, what about for that annoying person that always needs something? I mean, look at the stories. That's really what it seems like this entire era of the world was filled with when Jesus was on earth. Everybody always needed something. Are you willing to give up those special moments for someone who needs something? So here's what Jesus was doing. Many of them, Jesus was on his way somewhere else. He had somewhere to be, places to go, things to do. He was supposed to be there. And he got interrupted, just like the one that we were reading today. He was in the middle of teaching when it would happen. While visiting friends' house. Well, it happened. Well, eating dinner. Well, at a wedding. Celebrating a holiday. I guard my holidays. My family time, it's like, no, get out of here. This is my family time. He was wrapping up his day. He was trying to sneak away and get some alone time. He had just gotten done healing someone else. And another person walks up. And another person walks up. He had just climbed up a hill and sat down to take a break. He had just climbed down from a mountain. People just found him wherever he was. Well, he was going to church. He'd go to the temple and it would happen there. He had just woken up from sleeping in the middle of settling an argument for somebody. And my personal favorite while getting betrayed by one of your best friends and arrested, he still has compassion on someone who is part of the group arresting him and heals his ear when Peter cut it off. He gave and gave and gave. It didn't matter what circumstance it was. When he felt the prompting, he did it. He was interrupted nonstop. I don't even know if you could call those interruptions anymore. It was just, it was the way he lived. If you don't have margin time, if you haven't learned to live in a flexible way, it's going to be very difficult for God to use you in the moment. Very few of Jesus' amazing moments were planned. We have to have the time. We have to have created the time and live in a flexible way so that God can interrupt our plans with his. So if you have the right heart, you start to become flexible and create that margin time. Okay, now what do I do with that time? You love. You love and love and love every person that comes in front of you in every way that you can. 
We live our life with our eyes wide open, looking for opportunities to bless people. We live generously with our spouse. We give and give. We give it all. We put their needs ahead of our own. We sacrifice our dreams, our goals, so that they can accomplish theirs. We love our children with a generosity that isn't matched by anyone else. We have patience as we clean up vomit at 2.30 in the morning from a pillow and a comforter and the sheets and the floor and now your sock because you stepped in it and the trim and the door. This may have happened this week. Some examples are easier to come by. You love your kids when they do something that's embarrassing to you. That brings your name down. You hug them. You love them. We do the same with our friends. We love them. Unconditionally. Generously. We pray for and show love to that coworker and to our boss. To that person we just can't stand. You realize Jairus... The guy that he healed his daughter, that he did everything for that day, he was part of the group that was hostile towards Jesus. He was part of the group that was trying to get him removed, trying to get him killed. Those are usually the first people that when you get exhausted, you're like, yeah, cutting you out. I still got it from my friends, but there's not much left. I'm going to save it for them. None of that stopped Jesus. Jesus walked. They walked and walked and walked and walked everywhere. We don't always get that opportunity anymore. We drive. You know, back in the day, Jesus, I guess maybe a big motorcade would have gone by and we would have been like, hey, there's Jesus. Take pictures. Or a car would have driven by, you would have no idea. You know, the, the world was, was set for this type of love. It doesn't mean that we can't love, though. And what if even as we start driving, we just start, it just said, God, every time I get in the car, my eyes are wide open. All right? First off, you'll be a better driver. Second off, you might start to see things that you haven't noticed before. I've had God speak to me and say, hey, turn around, ask that person that's walking if they need to ride somewhere. And the conversations that happen in those car rides are amazing. See someone at a bus stop, hey, do you need a ride? Okay, be careful with this. I'm actually more so not even saying for, for your safety as much. Because if God's telling you to do it, do it. He's going to keep you safe. But don't roll up. Hey, uh, I'm a 40-year-old guy asking what seems to be a 20-year-old girl. Hey, do you need a ride somewhere? You want to hop in? No. Okay, let's be smart about this. But God's going to speak to us. He's going to give you opportunities. He's going to see that car that's broken down in the middle of the intersection and everyone's going around because they have places to be and you pull over and hop out and push on the car to help at least get them out of the intersection. It's the minimum we can do. You see something that just isn't right. The person in winter that's walking and they aren't dressed for walking. The person at the stoplight next to you that's just tears rolling down the face at a red light. And can we at least pray? Can you roll your window down? Hey, is everything all right? I mean, it, it might turn green and that might disappear quickly, but we gotta at least try. When you walk through these doors on a Sunday or a Wednesday, are you here just for what you can get and what God can do in your life? Or do you realize that this is probably the main place that broken people are coming, as they should. And just because they weren't broken last week doesn't mean they aren't this week. But if you walk away from a broken person, they might be coming back next week and the week after still broken. How can we give? How can we live generously? Some people you'll give to and you'll give and you'll give and you'll give and they'll take and they'll take and they'll take. And there's no amount of giving that you can do that will change them from being a taker. So don't expect that they're going to change. Don't get mad at them when they don't. But just because they take doesn't mean that we change being a giver. It doesn't even mean that we stop giving to them. We give. I realize a lot of these examples don't sound like big miraculous things like Jesus did. Can we go back for a moment? God works in the ordinary, mundane, 
basic, boring details of life. Some of the coolest stories I've heard came from the smallest moments you never would have thought anything of. Mac said last week, we need to hold loosely to our finances. Like we need to hold loosely to our time. We really just need to hold loosely to our lives. It's not ours. It's not ours. Funny thing about this generosity thing, this is what I'll close with. I was thinking about that word generosity. We spent two weeks now talking about it. I looked up the English definition of it. Here, here's the English definition. Showing a readiness to give more of something as money or time than is strictly necessary or expected. Giving more than what's expected. What is expected of us from God? Our heart, our life, everything. How do you give more than everything? By the definition of the word, Christians cannot be generous. It's easy to think, well, I'm a Christian, I want to become a more generous Christian, and then even a more generous Christian. The words are together. You, you can't pull those apart. You can't separate those. Now, by the world's standards, you may be looked at, and the world may say, you're generous. But Jesus is going to look at you and say, good and faithful servant. Well done, my good and faithful servant. I know this one for me, man, it's just hitting me square between the eyes. How can I be more generous with my time? How can I be more patient, more exhausted I am? How can I deal with situations in a better way, with more love, more compassion? How can I make sure that I notice those situations when they come into my life? We're going to close with a song. I love it. It's just, it's the one we did earlier. The world needs Jesus. The world needs Jesus. That's, that's the thing these two people in this story had in common. Nothing else, but they knew that they needed Jesus. And there's not many things bringing us together in this world right now. There's a lot more things pulling us apart and dividing us. But one thing that brings us all together is we all need Jesus. Every person in this world no matter what they've done, how they've lived, the decisions they've made, what they've done to you, they need Jesus. And God has decided to use you for that. Are we ready? How do we need to change?